Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 457, Operation Munich. Last time, the Stalin line helped Moscow, practically not at all, or something close to that. Either way, it had been breached in multiple places, and now the cities of Novgorod and Kiev were being threatened. As for stomping the Germans in the south from going much further, that was now up to the Dnieper River and the Soviet troops and the guns on its far side. But what had given von Rundstedt and his commanders headaches thus far was the lack of a strong, quick-moving right flank. And while it's true that Stupenegel could have been faster, he and his had been given a specific task when Barbarossa got underway. Specifically, these men had been told to stay put, by Hitler, to protect the Ploesti oil fields. Back in April, just months before Operation Barbarossa was launched, the German 170th Infantry Division traveled to Romania, joining with other Germans already there as they toured the country's border with Soviet Russia. Now, technically, the Romanian forces were under the control of that country's dictator, Antonio Nescu, But in reality, it was given orders by Germany's 11th Army's commander, General Eugene von Schobert. Now, the training for Romania's fighter pilots had been intense, and proving this, when the invasion of Soviet Russia was launched, Stalin ordered hundreds of air raids against those same oil fields, but none of them did any real damage. Now, it was time to find out if the country's soldiers were also up to the task. But before the Romanians could help conquer Russia, they wanted their own back. Land lost to Russia after the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement of August 1939. After Poland was gobbled up by the two larger countries to either side of it, Stalin, testing Hitler's need for peace on his eastern front, at least for the moment, asked Berlin if he could have Bessarabia for cultural and security reasons. For reference, Two-thirds of Bessarabia is in modern-day Moldova, with the remaining part in modern-day Ukraine. Anyways, Stalin had asked Hitler for it, and as the latter needed his east calm, he said yes. So Soviet Russia loomed near Romania as touching Bessarabia, and the latter was forced to withdraw. The Red Army quickly moved in and annexed the territory. Hitler had swallowed his pride for the moment and told Bucharest to do the same. And in this same manner, the Russians were also able to take northern Bukovina and the Herzl region close by. And Tonescu wanted his lands back, and he wanted revenge. And during the planning stages of Barbarossa, Antonescu was told that one, all those lands, and more, would come back into the Romanian fold during Operation Muchin, or Munich. And two, together they would all advance on Kiev and watch together as the proud Stalin fell and lost everything. Which means, when Operation Barbarossa kicked off, Army Group South's front, if you will, was only that part of the area that did not touch Romania. So, between Rundstedt's area and Hungary. In a way, this was good for the Soviets, as there was no fighting there. Still, Prudence demanded that Soviet forces remain in that area. Yet when Operation Munich, the retaking of those lands, commenced on July 2nd, the area now needing defended by Tulyulnev, just flown in from Moscow, had just tripled. Hoping to catch the Soviet forces opposite Romania by surprise, the German infantry, still needing a few miles to reach their jump-off points, traveled at night and slept during the day. But like how the Germans' first priority that morning of June 22nd were bridges, it would be the same here in the far south. The plan was to move out on July 2nd, but during the night of June 30th, in preparation, 46 men of the German 399th Infantry Regiment crossed a 300-foot bridge over the Prut River and secured it. This was the first major waterway in the area. Later that night, though, the Soviets counterattacked, and killed half of the Germans, but the latter still held the bridge on the morning of July 2nd. And during those early morning hours of July 2nd, that bridge and others were used to invade Soviet territory. This invasion force meant to inspire and buck up the Romanians 
was composed of the Romanian 3rd and 4th Armies, along with von Schobert's 11th Army. At 3.15 a.m. July 2nd, as the three army groups had already moved out, von Schobert's men got into small boats to cross the Prut or cross the bridges that they now controlled. As there were several tributaries from this river, like the Isi River, the Germans made sure to land men on both sides of those. The attack had to be as continuous a line as possible. And having done their reconnaissance, the German troops of the 11th Army hit an area between the Soviet 9th and 18th Armies. Why? Because the Germans knew that defenses there, though set up, had not yet been reinforced. Not enough to withstand an intense ground attack. In northern Moldova, the city of Belza, modern-day Balti, the German 30th Corps clashed with the 48th Rifle Corps. And in the center of Moldova, at Kishinev, the Romanian 4th Army fought, pushed their way in, and took control of that city. Not that everything went the invaders' way. At the very tip of modern Moldova is where the Prut and Dniester rivers come closest to each other. The German 11th Corps, Romanian Cavalry, and Mountain Corps pushed towards the town of Mogilev Podolski on the Dniester itself. For reference, it's located about 80 miles or 120 kilometers to the northeast of Romania's most northern tip. Also, it's almost due south of Novgorod by some 300 miles or 482 kilometers. The invaders wanted to capture a few bridges in the area over the Prut, and they thought they could do this with a sudden, overwhelming attack. The Germans came on, and indeed, a company of Brandenburgers were soon out in front. But suddenly, they and the main force behind them were brought up short. The Soviets made sure that that German company would not receive help, and then made sure they would never see their comrades again. The defensive line here held longer than most, and in fact, would cause a delay that soon affected the Battle of Uman. Using the rather unusual bulge that made up northeastern Romania at the time as a reference, at its center, but some 80 miles or 128 kilometers from there into Soviet territory, is the already conquered Kishinev, the capital of modern-day Moldova. And that's where Tulyulnev would send one of his counter-attacking forces. This was made up of the 2nd Cavalry, 2nd Mechanized, and 48th Rifle Corps. Tulyulnev's second offensive gesture was to take the 2nd unit, labeled the Coastal Group, made up of three rifle divisions, and have them move closer to the coast, to be near the Lower Prut. If one, or hopefully both of these formations, could hold up the Germans they may be forced to halt their operations left flank as well. It was deemed worth the risk. This counterattack hit between the German 11th Army and the Romanian 4th Army. At this point, von Schubert would have called for his tanks to stymie the Soviet charge, but he did not have any to hand. Why? Because at the last second before Barbarossa commenced, Hitler pulled the 14th Panzer Group from Schubert. Thus, he was forced to call in the 56th Corps to help hold the line. But, as we have gone back in time a bit to cover the German and Romanian far right flank, that puts us back to when the Stavka was still learning, as were the officers learning to fight with their men. Reeling from the attacks of Army Group Center that managed to capture over one million Soviet troops in their pockets, the Stavka started moving armies around in the south, which did not help Tulyulnev or Kurpanos. Soon, Tulyulnev was told to transfer the 7th Rifle Corps of three rifle divisions to the southwest front. Good for Kurpanos, right? No, as he was told to send the 16th and 19th Armies north to help protect the approaches to Moscow. The southern front was quickly becoming a second-tier theater, for now, but Stalin still expected positive results, and his ability to forgive had been burned long ago, back on June 22nd. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time, there's Granger, offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. 
Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. So, catching back up to the main action of Army Group South before we focused on Romania, with so many armies now missing from the southern and southwestern front, there was no longer a question of launching counterattacks. Now, all was about defense. Thus, on July 16th, Bunyene ordered Tulunev to pull back. The Dniester River was being abandoned. With the Soviets pulling back, they asked themselves, where are we going to stop? That was answered the next day, July 17th. They were to head for Uman. That would be where the next massive defensive line against the Germans and Romanians would be drawn. With the Soviet pullback, the Germans advanced. From a German point of view, as the Prut River, the first major river to cross, had helped protect cities like Belza, again in northern Moldova, and Kishinev, now that these were in German hands, the next river to cross to the east was the Dniester, which protected cities like Balta, and up to this moment, the defiant Mogilev Podolsky to the north and to the far south, along the coast, Odessa. But now that Soviet troops were pulling back from the Dniester, all these cities would soon be under attack. This left only one major river before the invading troops to the south reached the Uman area, that being the River Bug. But as impressive as the Soviet troops in this area had fought, the pullback exposed them to enemy attempts of encirclement. And that's exactly what von Rundstedt was planning to do. While the Soviets were between the Nista and Bug rivers, specifically, von Rundstedt ordered his left flank, consisting of the 11th Corps, Romanian's 3rd Army, and the just-arriving Italians, to head for the Bug River and then sweep south, or clockwise, to get in behind the Soviets before they crossed over. Perhaps even Marshal Tuyunev himself would be captured. Von Rundstedt's 11th Corps hit the Dniester River, on July 17th. They had tried this before and had been helped by Stuka's overhead, artillery support, and 88mm flat guns, now level with the ground, to take out Soviet bunkers. But for whatever reason, the Russians would simply not yield, offering resistance every time the Germans approached. But on the 17th, it was different. It felt different to the Germans. The pushback they had experienced now was much weaker. Soon the 11th and 30th Corps, with Romanian cavalry and mountain corps, crossed over in large numbers by July 21st. Meanwhile, the 54th Corps, mopping up the recently fallen Kishinev, was still lagging behind. But expecting to dash ahead to catch up to the obviously now retreating Russians, the invaders were suddenly slowed down, not by resistance, not by partisans operating in their back area, but by rain, which produced mud, and Stalin's scorched earth policy. The Germans and Romanians had nothing with them except for what they brought with them. It's worth noting that when the Italian Expeditionary Corps showed up, there was much rejoicing. Yay! But it was time to test these men of fascism. The Italian Pasubio Division, led by General Messi, had, by this time, otherwise acquired the trucks he needed for his men. Thus, the Pasubio Division would lead the attack, while the Torino Division, with not enough trucks, walked in the rear. In the coming days, the Italians would show themselves brave and tough, making life hard for the retreating enemy troops. A big part of von Rundschiff's plan of trapping hundreds of thousands of enemy troops on this side of the river bug was the Luftwaffe, and true to their missions, they destroyed bridge after bridge that Tulunev's men needed to head for Uban. But just as fast as they were destroyed, Soviet pioneer units rebuilt them, and after their comrades traveled across, they worked even harder to now destroy them. In the end, Tulunev and his staff would get away. The German 11th Army would not have its glorious kessel or pocket of trapped men. 
zooming out to cover the area that Army Group South was responsible for. Now that the Stalin line had been pierced and the far right flank was starting to catch up, Hitler's spirits were bucked up. Remember, he had wanted to split the 1st Panzer Group to have one part take Kiev while the other kept moving east. But not only was von Rundstedt against this and wanted the 6th Army of Infantry to take Kiev, but General Franz Halder, Chief of Staff of the OKH, or Army High Command, just wanted Army Groups North and South to handle their own damn problems without bothering Berlin, so he, Halder, could keep Hitler focused on taking Moscow, not unlike herding a room full of cats. But as ever, events on the ground dominated. As we have seen, soon elements of the 13th Panzer Corps were mere miles from the west of Kiev, while 17th Army neared Vinitsa, which would set off Russian counterattacks near there, as we have seen. As for just above Kiev, the Soviet 5th Army backed up and to the north, disappearing into the Pripyat or Rikitno marshes. Problem was, for the Germans, this massive area was simply not just marshes. Though the area in question extends 480 kilometers or 300 miles west to east and 225 kilometers or 140 miles north to south, it is a varied landscape. True, the lowest parts have marshes, moors, and ponds, but the more elevated parts have forests, thus a decent hiding place it could be for those in the know. The Germans had hated even talking about this area during their planning, so when not avoiding it, their only comment was to stop or destroy any enemy forces heading into it. But that had failed. Back to the fighting. When the elements of the 13th Panzer were able to approach Kiev, they had inadvertently split von Reichenau's 6th Army. No worries. The northern half stayed with von Reichenau, while the southern part was temporarily formed into its own unit called Group Schwedler, and they were to fight there. But, as we just saw, von Reichenau had let the 5th Army escape into the marshes. His job had been, indeed, most of Army Group South was to focus on at this moment, according to Hitler, the destruction of enemy forces in the area. After that, things would take care of themselves. But von Reichenau had failed his leader, and he would fail him again when he died in less than a year from now, on January 17, 1942. In fact, the high command had known that von Reichenau had suffered a stroke the year before and was not at his best, but decided to keep him in his position as he was respected by his men and his superiors. But... General Potopov and his 5th Army weren't going to hide in the marshes forever. No, they would come out now and then and harass von Reichenau's troops. This, combined with reinforced Soviet air forces striking when they could, kept the sick German general from focusing on his new main task, taking Kiev. Ohio, ready for some quick mental health facts? Let's go. Nearly 2 million Ohioans live with a mental health condition. In the U.S., more than 50% of people will be diagnosed with a mental illness in their lifetime. Depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide. So why are some of us still stigmatizing people living with a mental health condition when we know all of this? Let's listen to the facts and beat the stigma. Ohio, challenge what you know about mental health at beatthestigma.org. What made the fighting more difficult on the Axis far-right flank was the added component of naval craft. When the invasion started, the Soviet Danube flotilla had five river monitors, 22 armed and armored motorboats, and seven minesweepers. Opposing them, the Romanian flotilla was a bit smaller, with seven river monitors and four smaller armed boats. And once Operation Munich got underway, there would be fighting on the Black Sea, as there was on land. Early on, when the Russians were still thinking in offensive terms, Stalin wanted these enemy ships pushed to the side, so Soviet troops could be landed behind the main fighting to either take prisoners for information or simply cause mayhem. 
The first clash on the water near the boundary between Romania and Soviet territory took place on June 23rd. Not much came of this, but the next operation would pay off handsomely. The Stavka, in trying to distract the invaders wherever or however they could, saw potential in the far south, as the Germans and Romanians would be working together, but was this a smooth partnership? Thus, the Romanian coastal town of Constanza was chosen. The Soviet idea was to go in with men, landing from boats, to cause havoc, certainly to the Romanian AA units. Then, later that day, Soviet bombers would come in and finish the job. The town would be destroyed. This attack, as long as it was somewhat successful, might force the Germans and Romanians to hold men back to prevent other attacks. Two Soviet destroyers would get in close and bombard the city, while a cruiser and a third destroyer kept them safe. And indeed, the bombardment that morning of June 26th did cause some damage to the city. Then, however, coastal guns opened up on the Soviet ships, soon joined by several Romanian ships. The attacking Russian destroyers took some damage and backed away, unfortunately, right into a Romanian minefield. One of the destroyers was lost. The cruiser was also damaged by the mines, but made good its escape. As for the Soviet bombers, the ones who were to deliver the real damage, not only did they come late, but scored no direct hits. For this, nine Soviet bombers were shot down. But a supporting naval action connected to this raid delivered results that would please the Stavka and Stalin. Just north of Constanta at Chilia Vece, Soviet armored motor gunboats landed enough men to capture the majority of the Romanian 15th Marine Infantry Battalion, about 468 men. But this would be the only bright spot. The Soviet naval forces would come again and again, but now, wise to the nighttime raids, the Romanians upped their game. The Soviets would continue to lose craft of all kinds, until Stalin got it into his head that now was not the time for attacking. As for Kiev, Colonel General Ewald von Kleist, commander of the 1st Armor Group, was determined to make that city his. By July 10th, his leading panzers could see the spires coming from the area's capital. These men of the 13th Panzer Division just knew that another victory would soon be theirs, And it didn't hurt that the next day, July 11th, the 14th Panzer pulled up right beside them. Then the 25th Motorized Division. All these units were now along the Urban River. But there was something missing. That being the division's artillery and much of its supporting infantry. They were still either in trucks or on foot trying to catch up to the Panzers. So the question now was, do we wait? and start with a proper traditional siege, or do we let the Panzers seize the day and charge in now? And that question would be answered by Eberhard von Mackensen, commander of the 1st Panzer Army. He was the man on the scene, and thus he would determine when the Germans would be knocking on Kiev's door. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So um, I don't have any new members since last time. Um, What are you doing? There's like 240 episodes waiting for you. Anyways, I'm not here to push. I don't don't push. I'm not a pusher. Anyway, uh, sorry, my voice, as you could probably tell during the episode, not so good. Anyway, so as far as donations, uh, let's see here. Anthony DeLuca, and I think Anthony's donated several times, so I feel confident and comfortable saying, Hey, Tony, thank you. I'm sorry, that was so wrong. And the other person who donated was um, Renee Cormode. Um, if I got that wrong, Renee, please send me an email to let me know and I will happily correct it because, you know, I'm here to learn, laugh, and love just like you. Take care, everyone. <laughs>